Welcome back to The Dive. The yield curve inversion, interest rates, oil, the housing market, digital assets, gold and silver are the topics that our guest will deep dive into today. He is the founder, owner, author, speaker and consultant of The Morgan Report and the silver guru himself, David Morgan is joining us today. But before we bring David on, do me one quick favor and go ahead and just tap that subscribe button below me there. Hey David, nice to see you. Welcome back to The Dive. Well, it's good to dive back into The Dive, Cassandra. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the global bond market. The yields have been rising sharply with U.S. Treasury yields nearing their three-year highs and parts of the curve starting to invert. Do you think that this is a clear indication that a U.S. economic recession is coming? Yeah, an inversion in the yield curve is almost a guarantee that we'll have a recession. That's point number one. Point number two, as I've said many times, the bond market is the key because the credit markets or the debt markets are the most important aspect of this financial system. So when that starts to break down or come into question, that basically shakes the foundation of the whole system. And it doesn't mean the end, but it's happened over and over through history. It's a kind of a repeat. The biggest concern of mine personally is that it's the first time it's global because the US dollar is a global currency, which means that the treasury of the United States, the T bills, T bonds, T notes are all sacrosanct. That's considered to be the most perfect uh, longer term, short to long term investment that cannot be defaulted upon. And yet they can be because you could print up enough finding money to where the payoff of the bond, you'll get the principal back, you'll get your interest back, but it doesn't buy you anything. Are we going to get there? We're going that direction. I think something will take place before that, what I'll call eventuality that's always happened, always happened in a fiat money system. Mm -hmm. Now, Fed policymakers are calling for the central bank to raise its benchmark interest rate to 3% this year. We have to ask, what do you think prevents the central bank from raising rates aggressively? Fear. They know from doing it once before a few years back that just a modest increase in a few basis points, 25, 50, 75 basis points, not even a full percent was enough to shake the stock market to the core. And they reversed uh, their schedule and decided it wasn't time to do it. And now they're between a rock and a hard place and there's no way out. In order to curb inflation, they must push uh, interest rates higher. But if they do, then the payment system for the interest on the national debt becomes unfathomable because uh, it's like a credit card. If you have to have credit card at you know, whatever you borrowed and it's at 5%, you can make the payment. But if the payment goes, the interest rate changes to 10%, then you've got a big problem. You might not be able to make that payment. So it's the same thing at the federal level. And it's very, very problematic. And anyone that's in finance really knows this. Governments know this. Politicians know this. But it's a big, uh, you know, elephant in the room that everyone's ignoring. No one's actually facing the music and they just continue to delay it. But as I just said and repeat, the delay is over. So it'll be interesting to see if they can get to 3%. If they do, then will that help? Not when inflation's running at their number at 7%. The only way to curb inflation is to put the real rate above the inflation rate. So that would mean you've got to be 7% by their numbers just to be yielding a true rate of return of zero. Uh, so if you got a 7% return on a coupon and it's 7% inflation, you're netting zero. So to get it above that, like Volcker did in 1980, when inflation was running 13%, he pushed interest rates up 17 to 20%. Will that ever happen again? The answer is absolutely not. There's no way it could happen this time. Mm, okay. Okay, so let's move on to oil here. The European Commission is set to unveil a detailed plan in May to stop buying Russian fossil fuels by 2027 in response to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This means that they are cutting 40% of EU gas. 
Do you think that this is realistic? Totally unrealistic. It looks good for the politicians. And look, there's nothing more important in the world than energy and food. And without energy, you don't want to grow food. I mean, a lot of natural gas is used as fertilizer uh, after it's processed, we're becoming fertilizer. So we are in a world of hurt. Sounds great. I don't think it'll be achieved. Um, certainly, they'll make effort to do it, you know, maybe more green energy or that type of thing. But nothing is more efficient than uh, the oil sector right now. You could argue uranium is, but when you look at the cost of a plant and the time to put in a plant and that type of thing, and then, of course, there are accidents that happen. There's Fukushima that we all know about. So, you know, the bang for the buck. Energy return on energy. Oil's bill number one. What are your thoughts on Russia only accepting rubles for natural ga gas in unfriendly nations? Well, not to sound too political, Cassandra, but it brings the adage, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> because the U.S. petrodollar was the domineering currency for the world after Nixon cut the gold window or stopped the gold standard or the Bretton Woods Agreement. And so the Saudis really wanted to exchange gold for oil, but uh, Kissinger went over and made a deal with them and said, basically, pay us protection money. As long as you settle all oil contracts in dollars, we will have your back. Well, that changed a few months ago when Russia basically is now the protection money. And now they're demanding the same thing that the uh, U.S. government did, which is pay us in our currency. So I'm not on either side. I try to be politically neutral, but I do have to chuckle slightly that uh, it's OK if the U.S. does it, but it's not OK if Russia does it. Well, wait a minute. They're just losing the exact same, ter very similar terms of what the United States did. It's just that the shoe's on the other foot and how does it feel? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on here. We saw you tweeting about the housing market. The average interest rate for 30 year fixed rate mortgages has increased to four and a half percent. Some say that the housing market is in the early stages of a substantial downshift and could trigger a decline in home prices. How closely are you following the housing market and where do you think it's going from here? Well, Senator, I think you outlined it correctly. I think it is going lower. Uh, you know, I am much older than you. And, you know, my first, no, my second home, the I bought the loan and the loan was at eight and a half percent. And that was a great loan because during the bulker years, uh, we were getting mortgages around 15 percent, believe it or not. Now, it didn't last too long because interest rates spiked under Volcker and then they came right back down. So people that bought at 15% would refinance at say 10% or that type of thing. Four and a half is not a bad mortgage rate at all, but relative to you know my lifetime. The point is simple. The higher it goes, the more people you're going to squeeze out of the housing market. And I believe that will be the trend. There'll be exceptions, especially in the current economic climate, which means Rural properties, farmland, safety areas, those type of things may carry a premium over what's in uh, crowded cities. So I expect the most to be hurt will be um, high density populations and probably less hurt or maybe even maintain an upward trend possibly would be uh, more rural property. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit here. Thailand has issued rules to ban digital assets from being used to pay for goods and services from April 1st onward due to the possible impact on the country's financial stability and the overall economy. Do you think that this will be a trend with other countries? I do. I think the whole crypto space has been um, questioned uh, by a lot of people, myself being one of them. Not against it. In fact, I'm almost certain it's the future. I think that the central banks will come up with the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, but they're going to regulate the ones that exist. They may uh, make them null and void in some cases. So there's a lot of turmoil in the space. I think the takeaway here, Cassandra, that I've discovered is in my crypto conspiracy series where I have 20, 20 different uh, interviews that Bitcoin has basically been usurped by, <clears throat> by the financial system, primarily by the folks at MasterCard. And the um, Ether, uh, I discovered with more digging, is pretty much usurped by um, 
by the banks, JP Morgan being one of them. So this is not as advertised or what it started out to be, meaning it's, you know, of the people for the people and by the people where we can do transactions without a bank in between. The banks may not be in between anymore, but they own the lion's share of the systems or of the crypto, the Ether crypto and the Bitcoin crypto. So this is concerning to me. And I wrote about it in, I think, 2014, when I wrote my two bits about Bitcoin that, you know, I'm free market. What, what do you care what I think? Let the market decide. Well, the market's decided that Bitcoin's pretty, uh, you know, it's valuable, at least at this point in time, relative to what it started at. However, again, you know, who owns it? It's uh, unfortunately, from what I read, the original white paper, more of a distributed, meaning wide base, small people, whatever, and was it going to be um, taken away by the, by the big money players, but it has. Now with gold, we've had this big run up for the past couple of weeks, even $10 away from new all time highs at one point, which has since come back down. How do you view the recent price action in gold? I think the run to gold has started, Cassandra. I really have talked about this for years, that there'll be a point in time when the crack up boom takes place. So people see inflation, they see that, you know, gas has gone from three to four to five dollars. Diesel, I drive a diesel Volkswagen, it's like 520 a gallon. <clears throat> and just not that long ago when I got to four, I was uh, like happy, but okay, I can live with four. I can live with five, but I don't want to. The point is that they see this inflation's insidious. It continues and continues regardless of the rhetoric from the political class telling us that it's temporary or it'll come down or they can control it. And so people will start to spend their money and that will increase the velocity of money. And it'll be primarily for needs. It'll be food, shelter, uh, you know, gasoline, utilities. There won't be a lot of extra capital there for vacations or that party dress or whatever most people you know, can afford going back a few years. So that's the system that we're in. And once that psychology takes place, it's, it's as an Austrian, it's a function of how much money they've pumped into the system. And that's somewhat true, but it really depends more on psychology. The money's there, but if it's sitting static, sitting in a safe and no one touches it, it's, it's as if it doesn't exist. But when the money's there and the people say, I got to get rid of this fast, I got to buy something now because it's going to cost me more later. Once that psychology hits, it's really hard to turn it off. Now, I lived through that and I watched that psychology change as a young person. And I saw almost everybody was buying something, automobiles, mostly it was investments and primarily the precious metals in those days that people were running to it because they knew that costs would be higher and higher and higher. And Volcker had the guts to step in and say, all right, inflation's at 13, we'll make the bond at you know 17, you're gonna get a real return. It just killed the gold market and brought things back into, let's say normal, but Again, we couldn't do that today, it'd be impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we can't let the silver guru go without talking about silver. What are you seeing in the silver markets right now, David? Oh, the doldrums. It's really got a lot of people like ho-hum, come on. <laughs> no. But uh, under the current conditions with gold leading the way, and I think a lot of people coming into the gold market, silver will follow. I do still believe silver will outperform. And I think a lot will depend uh, to forecast what happens this year. I think we'll get the normal 10% compounded annual growth rate that uh, gold has exhibited for over 20 years. So if you take the baseline at 2000 and take 10%, we're looking at $2,200, $2,300 gold. I think that's at least what's gonna happen. Probably the same return in silver. So you can take today's 25 and add 250. But at some point, and it could be this year, there will be the run the gold will go from a quiet walk to a jog, and then from a jog to a run, and from a run to a sprint. Now that's probably over the next few years, but the trend is in place and it will continue. So anything can happen. I haven't said it for a while, Cassandra, but the old black swan, and there is so many black swans flying around out there with you know, the supply chain, food, energy, the war, political classes, um, 
the illness, what would really happened with it, what didn't really happen with it, uh, what's really going on everywhere. And people don't like uncertainty. And then, of course, what's happening in the currency markets, it's like, well, if I'm in Canada and they're going to close down my bank account, then maybe I ought to move into some precious metals because at least those I own myself, I could touch them, they're tangible, and they've been money for thousands of years. Whereas with the onerous uh, government slash banking system, maybe everything that I think is mine turns out to be theirs and they can, uh, you know, stop it or ice night it, you know, freeze it, <clears throat> or maybe even, uh, you know, scold you for, uh, for your political views. So it's very tenuous and people will do what's normal. There's a survival instinct and there is a financial survival instinct. And that's why the run to gold has started. Um, where can our audience go to get more of your commentary before we let you go here? Uh, the best way is just go to the main landing page of themorganreport.com, sign up for our free email letter. If you're interested in making money in the resource sector, you can check out the subscribe tab. And I do a fair amount on Twitter. Um, if you go to the blog and just open up the blog page, all of our icons for Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, are all on the upper right hand side. So you can just click on those and go immediately to our YouTube page, for example. All right, well, thank you so much, David. We'll see you next time. My pleasure, thank you, Cassandra. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching today. We'll be back again tomorrow. But in the meantime, why don't you check out one of our other videos?